ಸದ್ಗಮಯ ತಮಸೋಮ ಜ್ಯೋತಿರ್ಗಮಯ ಮೃತ್ಯೂರ್ಮಾ ಅಮೃತ ಗಮಯ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಓಂ ಲೀಡ್ ಅಸ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ದಿ ಅನ್ರಿಯಲ್ ಟು ದ ರಿಯಲ್ ಲೀಡ್ ಅಸ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಡಾರ್ಕ್ನೆಸ್ ಅನ್ ಟು ಲೈಟ್ ಲೀಡ್ ಅಸ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಡೆತ್ ಟು ಇಮಾರ್ಟ್ಯಾಲಿಟಿ ಓಂ ಪೀಸ್ peace peace the subject this morning is i'm afraid an advanced one let me explain what i mean a senior monk once told me that when you give a talk in a talk there should be something for everybody there should be something for the newcomers the first timers who are coming to vedanta and something for the advanced students also something new for them so that's what i usually do you see uh, i tend to begin at the beginning in mo- most of my talks but today it's not like that today we're going to talk about certain aspects of advaita vedanta which are questions which come to the minds of those who have been in it for a long time so these questions are dealt with in today's talk um it actually concerns one word in a mantra from the brihadaranyak upanishad the mantra which we have been deliberating upon for some time now a very beautiful mantra which encapsulates to my mind at least the entire teaching of vedanta atmanam jed vijaniyat ayam asmi ti purusha kimichchan kasya kamaya shariram anusanjwaret if a person just like us if a person just like us we have the the purusha where to realize i am this infinite being immortal existence consciousness bliss then seeking what and for whose sake would one continue to suffer along with the body so here you see it starts with us an individual being like us coming to the realization of our true nature which means we do not know our true nature yet Uh, we are therefore not this individual being which we think we are vedanta reveals this to us our true nature and our true nature is uh, not a limited body a body which is born and ages and dies a body which is different from the rest of the universe not like that but an unlimited existence um, which is neither born nor does it die nor does it change or age um, nor is it different from the entire universe so this uh, realization which when it comes the result of it is a transcendent a transcendence of limitation kimichan desiring what that that desiring what it shows us the very nature of our life now it's basically a nature of desire we want something in life we're going from goal post to goal post and it's always shifting and never satisfied ever roaming around in the desert of this world so that is overcome we no longer seek limited things because we have attained something that is unlimited and for whose sake it says kasya kama hai for whose sake uh, that means the little being which we identified ourselves with i am this person and for the sake of this person i want um you know name and fame and success and happiness and pleasure and and money and people everything for this little being no i realize i am not this little being i begin to get this clarity that i am already something much vaster than this little being therefore why for this little thing should i keep on running around day and night uh, let it take its own course it will go on in its own course as swami vivekananda says let karma float it down ha huh? he no no more than how body lives or goes its task is done so it was a vessel which brought us to the shores of realization its task is done shariram uh, anusanjwaret why would you be the wording is very nice why would you continue to be fevered along with the fever that is the body <laughs> it's a kind of fever you know in uh, uttarakhand in the, uttarakhand in the himalayas when a monk dies the language they use is unka sharir shant ho gaya his body has been quieted is now at rest <laughs> his body has a, there is a cessation in the body so it was like a fever 
and the ball fever is now gone. <laughs> so the person in his in his or her real state now, the b- body is. Why would you continue to be fevered along with the body? So this is the nature of realization. We come to an understanding through the processes of Vedanta. That's why I say this is for. Uh, people who are already acquainted with Vedanta and that's not a problem. I know just about everybody here and I'm sure most people who are on the virtual audience, uh, very few of them would be first timers. Most of them have already heard this. So it will be very meaningful. Most people who have been in Vedanta know that by various processes of investigation, investigation into what? Into our current already available experience. That's the beauty of Vedanta. Vedanta talks about what is already here. Not something to be attained later. Not some place you have to go to. Not some kind of experience you have to await. What is already here, you take a look at it with the help of Vedanta. And then we realize, I am not this, uh, I'm not anything objective. Because it's an object to me, the subject. I am not the drishya, I am the drashta in the language of Vedanta. I am not what I took myself to be. This body, we investigate and we find this body has five layers, subtler and subtler and inward and inward. You know, the physical layer, this one. Everybody has this physical physical layer. And then there is the life processes going on within, which is called the vital layer. And then even subtler and within. By within, I don't mean physically within. Physically within, you will find more more physical layer only. Flesh and blood and... I mean, uh, in a subtler sense, life processes. Subtler than that is the thoughts and feelings which we all have. Nobody can capture it with an instrument, but we all know, we all internally we feel. We are thinking, we are remembering, we are understanding or trying to. And all of this is going on now, that is the mental layer. And the mental layer itself has a higher kind of functioning, which is called a layer of the intellect, which we we are using for, we use for science and philosophy and understanding things in daily life. And beyond that, in deep sleep, um, we access the deepest core of our being, which is which feels like a blankness. It's called the, the bliss sheath. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, annamaya, pranamaya, manomaya, vijnanamaya, anandamaya. And Vedanta says, this is not Vedanta, by the way. These five sheets are not Vedanta. These five sheets are something that's already available to us. Vedanta just labels it. For what purpose? By labeling it, we identify and we realize it's an object. It's a thing, just like this thing. It's a thing. A doctor uh, from, I think, uh, in England somewhere or Scotland, he uh, emailed me once in excitement saying that I was looking at a scan of the body and I realized I've been looking at such scans all my career. And I realized it's a thing. Where am I in all of this? I, the awareness, this aware being, which I'm already, I am, I'm not in the five sheets. I am the witness of the five sheets. All the problems and limitations are in the five sheets. But I, the witness, do I have those limitations? Do I age like the physical body? Do I get hunger and thirst like the like the vital body? Do I become frustrated and unhappy like the mental body? Do I have knowledge and ignorance like the intellectual body? No. I am the witness of all of that. Similarly, the witness of the waking and the dreaming and the deep sleep, it all points to the same reality. Each process does not yield a different witness. It's the same thing. So by all of these means, um, you have, you'll have the feeling of deja vu, you know. that Yes, we have heard all this somewhere earlier. Now, in the, so you're in the right place now. Now we are going to go ahead. All of this, we begin to get an appreciation and depending on the depth of our understanding and clarity, you will feel, yes, this is so. You will either feel, I'm beginning to get it. You will feel that it's possible that this is the truth. To the extent that it is so, it's very clear to me. Now what is the problem? The problem is, here here is the subject of today's uh, topic, non-dual awakening. It still does not have the feeling of an awakening. You feel I've learned a particularly clever philosophy, a very subtle system of thought. I can't live it. I can't walk the talk. Life throws, what is the American phrase? Curved ball at you. And I can't deal with it. And it's happening every day. How do I convert this 
uh, so much study and understanding into something that into the currency of life into day to day how do i deal with my problems how do i rise above it so that is the subject today this is non dual awakening vijaniyat one word and uh, this word from the mantra and the briyadarnya upanishad vidyaranya swami in his text panchadashi he writes about 37 verses 40 verses approximately on this one word and he deals with several of these advanced topics which a person already immersed in vedanta comes across these questions how do i make this a living realization how do i get that non dual awakening what is the nature of the problem here why am i facing this problem what is the uh, solution vedantic meditation that's the solution nididhyasana how is it different from the meditation that i already do and what is the relation between the the, the two of them mm. um this vedantic meditation do i do it with eyes closed and a particular time set aside for it or at other times also can i do it is it something to be repeated so it's very subtle points of this, um, of interest how do i do it so this is what we is going to be discussed that's why i said it's an advanced uh, subject but not for you <laughs> you're all advanced students that way so what is the problem here in uh, vedanta when we enter into vedanta study and practice it's not just studying it it's studying it understanding it and then living it ultimately vedanta is practical as swami vivekananda said in fact he said it was practical first and then philosophical so uh, in this process what are the obstacles that come up and vidyaranya very helpfully he gives that he classifies those obstacles uh, in the pursuit of vedanta into three one is at the level of the study itself when you hear the teachings and you're told that the teachings are from all based on the upanishads so these are texts and the problem at the first level is a textual problem that doesn't concern us today i'm just uh, putting it out there so that you identify what what the different levels of problems are first is the textual level problem where when we actually really seriously study it and go to the original text the upanishads and we see various things are said there what does it all mean when you put it together a particular sentence when the upanishads a text so a particular text in the upanishads does it mean is it talking about the individual self or about the supreme self uh, is it talking about uh, something apart from this physical universe or a reality of this physical universe is it talking about um, um, uh, you know what is it recommending is it recommending ritual action karma or is it recommending a kind of meditative exercise upasana or is it recommending knowledge gyana these are big issues when you read the texts because it seems to be saying all of these things um is it saying that the universe is one reality advaita or a composite reality of parts vishishta advaita or a distinct discrete reality of separation where separation is real dvaita vedanta and the texts there are texts supporting each position which philosophy dualism qualified monism non dualism which one captures the the upanishads ba- best because they are all based on the same upanishads so this is at the level of um text when we first come into the teachings and we actually take up the book and try to read for ourselves you may say i don't have these questions you are lucky so <laughs> you don't have these questions but uh, someone more skeptical than you uh, you are all sincere devotees but more, someone more skeptical than you might say that no this um, does not seem to support what um, advaita is teaching so you have this level uh, of doubts at the first level and this is clarified by study by shravana by a systematic study of the texts under a competent teacher you get clarity that all of this finally amounts to tattva masi aham brahmasmi it finally amounts to you are that ultimate reality um, the non dual teaching of uh, vedanta so this is an exercise uh, which overcomes this doubt you are by that time you are clear this is the teaching i am that ultimate reality brahman what is meant by i what is meant by brahman these things have become clear that's not today's subject 
Once have you once you have done this, you come up against the second level of problems, second obstacle. The second obstacle has a name. It is called asambhavana, the impossibility obstacle. I understand this is the teaching, but I have many doubts. How can I be pure consciousness? I am a body. How can the world, which is so tangible, I see it, I hear, smell, taste, touch, how can it be false? It is so evident. So, I have these questions about my reality. You're saying I am Brahman, but I feel I am the body. And I don't understand how I am Brahman. You're saying this world is an appearance in consciousness. How is this world an appearance? In These are deep questions and they need to be clarified. If your intellect, especially in the way of knowledge, if your intellect sets up uh, opposition, if it sets up uh, objections, you can't move ahead. Here it's, it's not a question of believing in it, it's a question of understanding. If you do not understand, then there's no point to it. So the second level of it is questions. Um, and you reason it out. Either by yourself, by repeated study, by discussions, and the texts, they help us. Because these texts are full of these questions. Many, many questions which we have never thought of. And some of them which we have already, it comes to us, our mind while we are hearing this. Questions keep coming up. You know, ask Swami, full of so many questions. Huh? Hundreds of questions come in from all over the world. So these questions have to be dealt with to get real clarity. Um, Conviction comes at this stage, that uh, every possible doubt is cleared and as each question is solved or resolved or even dissolved, uh, to use Wittgensteinian phraseology, when the question is dissolved, we, we get more clarity and this ends in conviction. Yes, this is not only possible, it is true and I am that. This is the stage at which today's talk begins. Now comes the real problem is that uh, this problem also, the third one, which is the problem we'll try to solve in today's uh, talk, or see how it can be solved. It is uh, called Viparita Bhavana, contrary tendencies. After understanding I am pure consciousness, I still behave like a body-mind at the level of behavior, the level of reaction to the world. So how do I solve this? For solving this, you have nididhyasana, Vedantic meditation. For solving the first level of problem, what was the first level of problem? Textual interpretation. Man, uh, shravanam. System hearing and uh, studying it systematically. Second level of problems, which is um, uh, the intellectual doubts about it. Lack of clarity. We have got many doubts. That is solved by mananam. And many of the texts. There are texts, entire texts devoted to this kind of deep critical thinking, um, Advaita Siddhi, Khandana Khanda Khadya, um, Chitsukhi, the entire text, very recondite, very subtle argumentation is there. And then we have finally, when we have got a clarity about it, by the way, you need not go through all those texts. And then you feel scared, oh, oh, good Lord, I have to read all those difficult Sanskrit texts to go through the first level and the second level, not at all. You can even read one text, study one text, a small one like Drik Drishya Vivek or Aparoksha Nubhuti. There's nothing in the even the deepest and most subtle argumentative texts. They do not go beyond what is taught even in the simplest uh, uh, teachings, uh, Prakarana Grantha, introductory text. The essence is what we have to grasp. Now, the third level we come to is how do I put it into practice? How does it become a living reality for me? And the solution for this is Nididhyasana. So you see, each level of Vedanta, Shravana, Manana, Nididhyasana is meant to actually remove, you can see Vedanta in this paradigm, it's meant to actually remove one obstacle. Now this is the level at which people ask, you know, it feels like an intellectual knowledge. After this, something more it seems to be lacking, something has to be gained after this. So how do we do that? And for that, Vedantic meditation is there. Swami Vivekananda called it assimilation. He said, tell yourself again and again. You see for yourself again and again. So hum, I am he or I am that. Till it tingles with every drop of your blood. Until it becomes a living reality. It should become effortless. So what is this problem and how does it come about? The problem is this. That the world is a dualistic world. 
It is a world of subject and object. And we act in this world through the instrument of a body and mind. And the entirety of our action in this world is dualistic. The world evokes a dualistic response from us. Not a non-dualistic response. Non-duality is not natural. Um, duality is natural. By natural I don't mean true. Duality is natural and false. Non-duality is not natural. But it is true. This is the problem. It has to be learned. You don't have to learn du uh, uh, duality. I'm not talking about dualism which is a philosophy. Which you have to learn. But duality. Just this way of subject-object dealing with the world. You don't have to learn it in a school. You don't have to go to um, you know topic of duality uh, awakening. Today the topic is non-dual awakening. You never give us a topic like dual awakening. Because we are already awa awake to that. We have been awake for lifetime after lifetime. It's natural for us. We are masters. We are jivan mukta. In, in, in We can't say mukta because the very nature of duality is bondage, is being trapped. There is this story of in the Uttarakhand of a, a monk who was a non-dualist and a friend of his, a scholar who was a convinced dualist and uh, um, so one day that uh, a dualist came and uh, said to him that Swami I'm not convinced about your non-dualism dualism is the truth so in Hindi he said this Dwait Satya Hai so the, the monk said to him, if dualism is the truth, well, even that cow, yonder cow who is chewing the, the grass in the field, that cow also knows that dualism is the truth. Because I and the grass are different. That's why I'm chewing it to put it into my mouth. Uh, if you are a pundit, a scholar, say something new. What that cow knows, <laughs> you are repeating that. In Hindi he said, Pandit ho to kuch nahi cheez batao. If you are a pundit, say something new. <laughs> yeah, so knowledge must be something um, which gives us an insight into reality, not just what you see to be, uh, to be real. Um, the great British philosopher Peter Strawson, Sir Peter Strawson, he made this dis distinction between descriptive metaphysics and revisionary metaphysics. Descriptive metaphysics is you take what it appears to be true and then design your metaphysics around it. And revisionary meta metaphysics is you question what appears to you and try to give a better or deeper understanding. So what you are saying does not seem natural. Um, the philosophy of the metaphysics you develop seems quite different from the way it is you are experiencing the world. And both kinds of metaphysics are there. So Advaita Vedanta would firmly fall in the um, category of revisionary metaphysics, not descriptive. But only apparently so. You see, that's, that's the beauty and subtlety of Advaita Vedanta. What, if this were the reality, how would the world appear? So, if Advaita Vedanta were the reality, if it was really, it's really true that I am existence consciousness, please. The world is a projection of Maya. If that were true, how would the world appear then? Just like this. <laughs> yeah. Is it really a revisionary thing or is it, it is the best kind of descriptive meta metaphysics actually. I remember having a discussion over coffee at the, at the Columbia faculty lounge with none other than Gayatri Spivak. And uh, a more staunch opponent of uh, at least conventional religion you will not find. Uh, but over coffee she was saying, she made a remark. She was obstinate on this point. That Swami, whatever is there, is here. Mm -hmm. Somebody had asked the Holy Mother, and she was giving a reference of Masharada. She said, somebody asked the Holy Mother about the possibility of other worlds, and you know, and the Holy Mother said, my child, whatever is, is here. And then uh, Gayatri Spivak was saying that, uh, uh, in Bengali she said, See how profound is the statement. Whatever is, is here. And this is the conviction upon which skeptics, materialists, um, those who are against religion, against any kind of transcendental thinking, they, they are firmly based on this. And so is she. But the beauty of Advaita Vedanta is that Advaita Vedanta says exactly, whatever is, is here. It is now and it is you. Advaita Vedanta does not move 
uh, even a millimeter from what is exactly presented to us now and for all times. There's no imagination there in Advaita Vedanta. We are pretty matter of fact, but really investigate, investigate. Advaitin would say to uh, Spivak or uh, Strassen that, yes, whatever is here, is here. But what is here? Take a look into your own experience. So, um, the problem is, the world is a world of dualism. It evokes a dualistic response from us. We have studied and understood that I am the witness of all things, including body and mind. And this entire universe, including body and mind, appear in consciousness, in being. They do not have an independent existence apart from our, uh, our, conscious, uh, our consciousness and being. Now, what is the reaction that we have? The teaching is Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya Jiva Brahma Hiva Napara. Brahman alone is real. The world is an appearance. And I am that existence, consciousness, bliss. I am Brahman. The Jiva, so sentient being is Brahman. What is our reaction to day-to-day -to -day life? The problem is, this, our reaction, the problem has two aspects. One is, I react as body-mind. I don't react as Brahman. I am this body-mind. When I say identified with peace, just I am this body-mind. We don't go around saying I am this body-mind, but we pretty much think and behave and feel as if we are body-mind. We think that we are this body-mind. Naturally, it comes to us. We speak as if I'm this body-mind. And it's, it makes sense to me that I'm here, I'm speaking from uh, this, this place, and you are sitting there. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the body and its actions and its location. And it's natural for me that this kind of conti uh, continuous conditioning we are doing to our own minds. So we react not as Brahman, but as body-mind to this world. And the second problem is, the world we take as real. What is out there? This is reality. Not Jagat Mithya, not the, that the world is an appearance. World is real. The people around us are real. This body is real. And the problems are very, very real. We, it's, it's very difficult to dismiss it as an appearance, as a dream, as equivalent to a dream. So this is the problem. We are, we are taught and we understand. By now we understand. Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya. But what, what do we feel and what do we behave like? Brahman is some kind of theory. Jagat Satyam, world is real. We are taught and we have come to understand. Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. But how do we behave and think? I am body-mind. We don't go around saying I am body-mind, but we feel and behave as if we are body-mind. So the problem has these two aspects. You see, if you go a little deeper, you will see immediately what happens. I am the witness consciousness. Witness of what? The first thing which I witness is the ego. We normally think I. But a little bit of Vedantic analysis reveals to me, not I, but the witness of I. As Shankaracharya sings, Mano buddhi ahankara chittani na aham. Ahankara na aham. This is the crucial distinction. Ahankara, ego. What is the ego? Right now you are feeling. By ego I don't mean the conventional way we understand it. Oh, that person has a lot of ego. Lot of ego means uh, very proud and obstinate and haughty. Not in that sense. That comes later. But before that, just the sense of I rooted in this body-mind. That limited I. Uh, which, uh, which appropriates to itself the activities of the mind. A thought comes in the mind, understanding. And immediately the ego says, I understand. No, you don't. Understanding is a function of the intellect. Uh, that's another module of the mind. Memory. Something is recalled from the mind, from the depths of our memory. What does the ego say? I remember. No, you didn't. <laughs> it is the memory which did it. It's one, it's a separate part of the mind. Desire. I want. Um, anger. I'm mad at you. Um, then uh, peace. Oh, I'm so peaceful. These are all activities in the mind and the ego appropriates them. Then from the mind to the body. Here, I am standing. The body is standing here. I am standing. Ego says, I am standing here. I am speaking. I am Sarva Priyananda. No, it's a cluster of physical and mental properties which the ego keeps on appropriating. And that's the definition of the ego in Vedanta. In Vedanta Sara, if you go, 
to and see what is the definition of ahankara ego abhimanatmika antakkarana vritti ahankara the appropriating function of the mind is called ego it's just a function of the mind it's not you it's an activity of the mind the ego is an activity ahankara it literally means ego making it's an activity of the mind and it ceases in deep sleep it ceases you don't cease so i am not the ego i am the witness of the ego shankaracharya says i am not the intellect not the memory not the intellect is there the memory is there ego is there the mind itself is there i am none of these i am the witness of that and they all operate but what happens is this gets occluded when we are not um fully enlightened when we are not jivan muktas when we have not gone to that when we are at the stage of i have understood but i can't live it what's happening is very precise here is the beautiful very elegant uh, analysis of the problem then we'll see how to solve it what's happening is i the witness consciousness the real con- witness consciousness that fact is occluded or hidden in the ego which dances around somehow we forget i am this witness consciousness and i think i am this dancing ego the moment i am this dancing ego everything around it i become identified with it desire anger memory this personality this little uh, creature the moment i become identified with the mind the mind is deeply connected with the body i become identified with the body i am this and the moment i become identified with the body the body is f- firmly a part of the physical universe the moment i become identified with the body what happens the physical universe out there becomes real for me it is is it's very difficult to consider that i am the body and then dismiss this as false you can't the whole dream is false you can wake up from the dream but in the dream you are running in the um, african jungle and a lion is chasing you and you're terrified somebody tells you oh it's a dream if you think i am the person running and the rest of it around me is a dream the jungle and the lion is a dream it won't work first of all you have to awaken from that limited uh, dream personality then the whole dream will disappear you see what's happening here identification with ahankara ego immediate identification with the mind identification with the mind immediate identification with the body identification means the feeling of i and mine and really consequent reality of this waking universe it becomes it falls into place as a solid uh, reality which resists you uh, it is there the philosopher arindam chakravarti gave an interesting interpretation of the world object i am the subject and this world is an object for me if i am this subject this world becomes an object for me what is object it is that which objects to my consciousness <laughs> it blocks my consciousness and appears as things you see hear smell t- all of these are blockages to the infinitude of my consciousness because it feels as other than my consciousness what a beautiful interpretation it objects to you <laughs> it objects to your infinitude you see but the enlightened person is also aware of these objects but for the enlightened person these objects do not object to that enlightened person they are they are part and manifestation of the reality which that enlightened person is he knows it appears there but it's not other than me like when you wa- awaken from a dream you remember everything but you realize i and whatever i saw in the dream all are me only so there nothing in the dream objects to me they are, they are not objects to the subject who i am so these are the two aspects of the problem i am this body mind and the world is real this is where advaita vedanta becomes theoretical it doesn't feel like a living thing you know that's why krishna says arjuna asked him in bhagavad gita there are two paths i can see you have clearly taught out me in the 12th chapter beginning of 12th chapter there are two paths so far in the last 11 chapters you have taught me one is the path of the impersonal absolute satchidananda brahmanaham brahmasmi he didn't say that i'm paraphrasing and another is the path that there is god all powerful omniscient loving the rescuer of humanity in distress and you are the avatar of god krishna this is the path of devotion and surrender this is the path of knowledge which one is better he says which yogi the one who is bhakti yogi or gyana yogi which is superior krishna is asked this by arjuna and krishna answers alas 
to the disappointment of us non-dualists he says bhakti yoga is far superior why he said the, the reason he gives there avyakta hi gatir dukham dehavad bhiravapyate because the impersonal absolute aham brahmasmi is very difficult to realize for those who are embodied embodied again if to understand careful embodied means with the body even the enlightened person in one sense is embodied because the body at least from our perspective uh, ramakrishna vivekananda the holy mother uh, all the other great uh, enlightened beings they have we can clearly see a body how is that different embodied means identified with body mind here i am in this body mind i think i am this only the enlightened person jivan mukta here the jivan mukta is in body mind but does not think that i am the body mind i am that consciousness in which body mind appears so this is crucial difference this is what is happening why the moment you become identified with the body the world becomes real and Ad- advaita becomes difficult that's why krishna says at that point advaita is difficult and at that point bhakti becomes more powerful better advaita though it is the direct path if you are in that particular tangle and most of us are and then advaita becomes very difficult and authority none other than krishna even worse this problem vidyaranya says when does it come and how often he says puna puna often and kshanat in a flash it comes see if it was a problem of identification with body and mind i'm mostly aham brahmasmi i am in bliss blissed out once in a month or once in a year suddenly i become annoyed identified with the mind or feel sick with the body uh, annual problem then it's not a problem at all like taxes <laughs> it is a manageable nobody likes it but it's manageable because it comes once in a year but um, this does not come once in a year puna puna often not all the time but whenever there's some obstruction in the world some kind of problem in the world some objection from the world we immediately react to it as a separate subject object entity you know like a dual dualistic entity we rip, i am this body this mind and i am annoyed and mad as hell with you <laughs> so this becomes a problem often every day every week every month and year it continuously we are having this again and again we are having this problem so puna puna often this problem comes up second um it comes in a flash what does it mean um it if it were to come with some warning it's coming you are you are aham brahmasmi but i am body this body as me <laughs> i am body this is going to come now you have got one minute of warning <laughs> you could even easily said, all right let me just quickly read drishya vivek or ashtavakra and be ready for the problem when it comes i'll tackle it no warning in a flash i am annoyed i am unhappy i am depressed i am miserable i am full of desire or passion or greed dissatisfaction flash it comes in computers in old days they had this booting sequence uh, not nowadays they are very fast probably this system is different but the booting sequence is i remember they uh, it would give you an opportunity to interrupt the booting sequence there was a default setting computer would load a few programs and pro- function in a particular way i'm talking about those dos based machines or earlier you know uh, or even later the linux based machines and you had an opportunity to interrupt it you pressed certain buttons and you stopped the default loading and you can put in your choice at a, at a time um but we don't get that opportunity with body mind it immediately goes into body mind mode into dualistic mode so these are the two problems what aggravates it comes again and again throughout our lives and this dualistic mode this body mind identification identification comes in a flash just imagine compare it with the state of the mind of say holy mother she was asked do you remember who you are all the time and she said not all the time my child otherwise it would be difficult for me to interact with the world but then she says it is available to me whenever i need it whenever i want it it's available to me of course there i know the specific incidents if you read about it she is being asked about her nature as the divine mother do you remember that but the same paradigm holds for the jivan mukta for us also do, do you remember all the time that you are brahman and we should be able to give that answer we don't think about it all the time but whenever we want 
it's available to us do you think about being sarva priyananda all the time no that would be a mental illness i am sarva priyananda i am sarva priyananda 2 hours in the morning 2 hours in the evening uh, no but i am so established in the idea of being sarva priyananda that it is available to me whenever i want it you ask me what's your name sarva priyananda easily effortlessly so there seems to be no confusion about it exactly like that it should be i am this infinite unlimited being awareness i don't think about it all the time but it's effortlessly available to me whenever the world tries to evoke a dualistic response from me the response from me is no i am the non dual brahman that is non dual awakening so nididhyasana vedantic meditation is to take us from this position that even in faced with this dualistic world of appearances we are firmly set in the no, in the knowledge i am pure consciousness chidananda roopa shivoham and the world is mithya as an appearance in pure consciousness not that i'm always thinking about it but it is available to me whenever needed at a moment's notice effortlessly so so that should be the that if you have that you are jivan mukta you are uh, in you are the living free now the question is vedantik niridhyas and how do we do it but before that another question is we are already almost everybody here and many people in the virtual audience we are already initiated we already have a mantra we already have a meditation technique what is the relationship of that to your vedantic meditation which is going to come up so the relation is that the meditation that we are doing in vedanta that is called upasana and that is preparatory foundational and very necessary for the success of nididhyasana very necessary um vidyaranya uses two terms kritopasti akritopasti kritopasti is a person who has worshiped who has meditated upon saguna brahman god the god of religion an avatar you know krishna rama rama krishna um, in some form and name and you have meditated upon that you have a mantra you have an ishta devata ishta mantra ishta devata and you have gone through this meditative exercises for a long time seriously up to the level of um, the savikalpa samadhi that actually having a vision of the of your ishta devata this is the whole course of um, mantra meditation ishta devata meditation this upasana this person who has done this is called krito upasti and vidyaranya says for the krito upasti non dual awakening is in the palm of his hand it's as easy as that the next step and the, all these things would be theoretical for us if it were not for the example of sri ramakrishna who who just demonstrated all of these to the you know to the maximum extent possible totapuri comes and sees sri ramakrishna sitting on the bank of the temple on on the on the ganga and sees that this person is fit for non dual realization why is krito upasti he has done the upasana the worship of god to the highest extent possible that he has the continuous vision or uh, vision of the divine mother available to him he feels the presence of god all the time is immersed in god consciousness in a dualistic mode theistic mode i am a devotee and i am the child and she is the mother in that way she is aware of the presence of god this mind is uniquely fit for non dual realization and then we know the whole story of how he teaches vedanta to sri ramakrishna and takes a just a little bit of effort and sri ramakrishna is absorbed in asampragnata samadhi nirvikalpa samadhi after that totapuri is amazed what took me 40 years of effort this man he is going into it, it, it in 3 days he has attained all of that so vidyaranya says krito upasti for that person one who has seriously done this mantra and ishta devata meditation and there are some other meditations also prescribed in the vedas you don't have to do all of them the mantra and ishta devata meditation itself is very powerful and sufficient for them non dualism is very easy the next level of vedantic meditation is very easy one little side note here if you look at the great master the life of sri ramakrishna written by swami saradananda ji there there is an essay I'll, it's a chapter but it's i'll call it an independent essay on spiritual practice 
So what happens when you get a mantra, when you get an Ishtadevata and you practice this, then how you get the living, uh, the, the experience of the living presence of the Ishtadevata in your heart, then it becomes Savikalpa Samadhi, actual the vision of the Ishtadevata. But then he goes on to say, it goes further. From Saguna Brahman to the Nirguna, from Saguna Dhyana to Nirguna Dhyana, to the meditation on the Absolute. The same process continues. So this is like a um, kind of like an appendix that Ishta Devata meditation itself can take you to the realms of non-duality. Now Vidyarnya makes a ob- further observation. He says there is this other category of seekers called Akrita Upasti, who may have been initiated, may have done meditation, but far from achieving any kind of depth and seriousness and steadiness in meditation. Or they have not done the uh, devotional meditation at all. For them, what is to be done? He says, such people, and he's writing 600 years ago. Nowadays, in modern times, there are many such people. I think he would be <laughs> aghast if he saw what is the condition today. Uh, he says, for such people, Vedantic meditation is essential. Nididhyasana, they have to do a long period of Nididhyasana. It will be a struggle. For those who are Kritopasti, not a struggle, pretty easy. For those who are Akritopasti, of which there are many, I think you would put all of us in the same bucket. He says, you have to work at it. Work at what? Vedantic meditation. Then only what you are looking for, the Jivan Mukti, the effortless awareness, Aham Brahmasmi, the effortless that the world is an appearance in me, that will come. It will come, he says. It's possible in this lifetime itself. But you must stay with it. Here I remember a very great teacher, one of the few teachers I I feel who are enlightened in this life. Um, In Haridwar I met him. So there was this discussion going on. A devotee said, uh, householder devotee, he had a kidney transplant. So he was talking about it to the Swami. And the Swami didn't know much about modern medical technology. So he was asking the devotee, how are you? And the devotee said, uh, Swami, I, I'm, I'm good. This transplant has been done, but I have got many restrictions now. Medicines and diet. The Swami was curious. Why? The kidney is already transplanted. Now why do you have any more restrictions and diet? Uh, the devotee explained that the doctor told me, if I do not take these medicines, if I do not follow the diet carefully, uh, what will happen is, this new organ, it will not be accepted by the body as part of the body. One. Second, if it's not accepted, I will not get the benefits of the new organ. It will not start functioning properly. Third, it may even die. It may be rejected by the body as an alien thing. So I have to follow these restrictions, this discipline and medicines. The Swami was so excited when he heard this. He looked around and he said to the gathered monks, Listen, oh monks, listen, this is exactly what you all should be doing. The knowledge that you have gained here, by strenuous study of Vedanta and listening to all these talks and everything, you have gained this. Now, you have to do Vedantic meditation, Nididhyasana. You have to settle down and stay with that knowledge seriously for a long time. Intensify your spiritual practices, not relax them. Intensify your spiritual practices, otherwise what will happen is, the knowledge will not be integrated into your personality. You will not feel that I am Brahman. Second, the benefits of that knowledge will not follow. Remember the benefits. Kimichan kasya kamaya shariram anusanjure. Transcendence of desire, transcendence of the limited personality, um, that overcoming the sorrows associated with body mind. Those those benefits will not flow, flow from it. Just like that organ. Third, the knowledge may even be lost. If you don't put forth effort, Of course, a genuine breakthrough will never be lost, but it can easily be covered over with the mud of worldly dealings. So he says, just like this man is undergoing um, a severely restricted lifestyle, similarly, intense practice is necessary. For Akrita Upasti, Vedantic meditation, do Vedantic meditation, but do it intensely. It will take time. Be ready for that. And it's not much. It's powerful. And Sri Ramakrishna says it's like you have got a mountain of cotton. How long will it take to burn if you put a burning matchstick into it? It will go up in flames immediately. You have, you have a dark room which is in darkness for a thousand years. If you light a match in it, how long will it take? Will it take a thousand years to become uh, 
lit up slowly, the light will spread. No, flash. Like that, what has been gathered over countless lifetimes will be burnt away in the space of one lifetime itself. That's pretty fast, pretty efficient. You don't have to do conditioning for the next 20 lifetimes to become Jeevan Mukta. No, in this lifetime itself. All right, moving ahead. What kind of Vedantic meditation? So there are two ways of doing Vedantic meditation. Uh, I will just broadly delineate what is mentioned and I'll give a little example of what is meant by Vedantic meditation. So two kinds. One is you may call it with eyes closed. Another one you can call with eyes open. With eyes closed, here it is very familiar to us. It is the entire technology of Patanjali Yoga which is imported bodily from the Yoga Sutras and put in Vedanta texts. In Vedanta Sara, you will find um, Yama, Niyama, Asana, Pranayama, Pratyahara, Dharana, Dhyana, Samadhi, the um, initial moral disciplines and how to sit and how to breathe and how to withdraw from the world, uh, how to focus and how to become absorbed in meditation. The eight limbs of yoga are very familiar to anybody who has read Patanjali Yoga Sutras. You will feel, am I reading yoga or Vedanta? It is Vedanta. But the technology of yoga has been imported. For what purpose? Not for the purpose in which it is there in Yoga Sutras. No. The purpose here is to stay with it. That understanding which you have gained through Shravana and Manana. That clarity and conviction. If that is not there, if I am coming for the first time, then that will, it's not relevant to us. But first of all, when we have got, when we have got this clarity, you stay with it. And this is a sitting meditation. You can't be moving around when you do it. You have to sit, you have to close your eyes, be still, calm and peaceful environment, regular morning, afternoon, evening. Mm -hmm. So you do this meditation and uh, withdraw inwards. That clarity you have got, you stay with it. The mind will keep distracting you. You turn away again and again and stay with that Aham Brahmasmi for some time, morning, afternoon, evening. So this is one kind. And you find it in a number of Vedantic texts. Um, it is the practice, the te techniques of yoga, which have been integrated into Vedanta. In fact, in one place, it leads to confusion sometimes. So somebody asked Swami Bhuteshanandaji, the 12th president of the Ramakrishna order. And the question, the background is, if you read the story of Totapuri and Sri Ramakrishna, Totapuri teaches meditation. Uh, teaches Vedanta to Sri Ramakrishna in meditation and then we see Sri Ramakrishna goes into Nirvikalpa Samadhi. Nirvikalpa Samadhi or Asampragnata Samadhi is something described and prescribed in um, Yoga Sutras. So, is it Yoga or is it Vedanta? What, what's going on here? Or is Vedanta ultimately it, it comes and joins Yoga or what is going on? So, the, this is the question. Um, so, a monk asked Swami Bhuteshanji, it's published now. Is Samadhi necessary for non-dual awakening, for, for Vedantic realization? Is Samadhi necessary? Bhuteshanji's answer was very clear. He has a crystal clear mind. Remember, he was about 97, 98 years old at that time. Crystal clear mind. He said, no. Then, he was not one to waste words. Is it necessary? He said, no. <laughs> but the the follow-up question was, but we read in uh, we read that Totapuri taught Nirvikalpa Samadhi to Sri Ramakrishna. His answer was, the reply to that was, then you must understand there are elements of yoga in that. In that teaching, there were elements of yoga in that. It is possible to attain realization through inquiry, self-inquiry alone, what was done in Shravana and Manana. But, uh, the yogic elements are imported to help you to stay with it. That assimilation of that truth, overcoming the obstacle, not for enlightenment, overcoming the obstacle, so that that non-dual awakening becomes a fact of life. For that, this eyes closed meditation. They don't call it that, I'm just calling it eyes closed meditation, but you understand what is meant by that. So practically what do the monks in the Himalayas and other places, uh, those who are uh, committed practice, practitioners of non-dualism, do they do this? Certainly they do it. Certainly. I have myself seen it. Hours and hours in meditation. But they are doing the Vedantic Nidhyasana. 
In contrast to this, there is also the eyes open. Again, my term, this is not, not a traditional term. Eyes open meditation. Um, Vidya Aranya, in the seventh chapter, he uh, mentions it and he describes it in a little bit. Um, the verse he says is, he calls it Brahma Bhyasa, practice of Brahman or practice of non-dual awareness. Brahma Bhyasa. Uh, what, what is it like? It says, Tat chintanam tat kathanam parasparam tat prabodhanam etadeka paratvamcha brahma bhyasam vidur buddha. Um, thinking about that continuously, uh, speaking about that, um, discussing it with others, this constant application to I am Brahman, this realization, this constant application, staying with it. This is called Brahma Bhyasa, the practice of Brahman by the wise, Buddha, the wise called this. Now notice, this is not eyes shut meditation. You may be listening to YouTube talks, you may be reading Rig Drishya Viveka, you may be um, studying text by yourself, you may be asking questions to the teacher, you may be talking about Vedanta to somebody who's, uh, who was asking. Remember, who is asking you. Don't be uh, missionary, your know, zeal, standing on street corners and handing out pamphlets. <laughs> come to, uh, be Brahman, come to. <laughs> Don't do that. That is not the way of Vedanta. Uh, or discussing it with others. Parasparam tat prabodhanam. Enlightening each other. Uh, students who discuss a particular topic. And the texts themselves involve you in that kind of discussion. This one-pointed application, staying with it. Not just one Vedanta talk and then forgotten. Back to the hurly-burly Manhattan outside. No, staying with it. And this is given in many places in uh, Vedantic texts. In the midst of your activities of the world, can you keep your mind on Brahman? Uh, that I am Brahman and this world I am active in is also an appearance. Just keep, the, keep your mind on that knowledge, that awareness, that understanding which you have already got. Gita. Brahma arpanam brahmahavi, brahma agno brahmanahutam, brahmhevate nagantavyam, brahma karma samadhina. Don't feel hungry. This is chanted before food. So everyone chanted with time for food. No, it is actually Vedantic nididhyasana. It means in the midst of actions, uh, one who realizes Brahman pervading every factor of action. The doer of action is Brahman. The person you are uh, performing the action for is Brahman. You are serving food maybe to somebody, that's Brahman. The instrument with which you are serving is Brahman. The food which you are serving is Brahman. It's actually taken from the paradigm of the Vedic Yajna. Mm. So every factor involved in action is Brahman. Though it has different names and functions and from name, form and function, Nama, Rupa, Vevahara, projected by Maya makes all this possible. But the underlying reality, the material, the substance of it all, let us say, uh, all carefully used words, um, that is Brahman. And to keep your mind on that, it is as easy as looking at all the pottery in a pottery barn and saying all of it is clay, you notice it. Looking at the waves in the ocean, you notice the waves, you enjoy the waves, the beauty and the dynamism of the waves, but you know at the same time, every bit of it is water. It's effortlessly, both are available to you, effortlessly. This samsara of name, form and function is available to you, body, mind, job, people, family, everything is available to you. All is one Brahman, names and forms are fleeting shadows coming and going. This should be equally available to us all the time. Staying with it is called Brahma Karma Samadhi. Krishna teaches Arjuna. Where? In the worst, terrible, most terrible circumstance, warfare. In the midst of that, can you be aware of, a, of the presence of the divine? So, this is called with eyes open. Meditation with eyes open. Which one should I do? Both. Both. With eyes closed, it's a little difficult. It, but it takes practice. But we must do it. And also with eyes open, during our waking hours, keep your mind on this um, in the midst of it. How is it possible, especially in the midst of our, all our activities? Sri Ramakrishna gives beautiful examples. It's actually possible. It takes a little bit of practice at first, then it's possible. And then it can actually become effortless. Even the Vedantic meditation becomes effortless. How so? Sri Ramakrishna, he says, do you, did you not, do you not see how the village women, uh, he, uh, he had seen in the north, northern part of India, 
you know, women going to get water from the well. So they go in a group and they carry these pots, sometimes on their waist, sometimes on their head. Pots of different sizes, big and medium and small. Not only that, they fill it up with water and they're heavy and they put one above the other. And they carry it back carefully, ever so carefully, because if, if one tumbles, it'll all come crashing down. And not only do they carry it back, while they're carrying it back, they're laughing and gossiping and talking with each other. He says exactly like that. You can learn to keep your mind on I am Brahman. You can do the same thing for devotional practice also. You can keep your mind on the mantra. But here in our particular case of Vedantic meditation, if you apply that example, this awareness, this truth which you are already understood, you have studied it and you are clear about it, try to keep it here, in the midst of it, even while the body and the mind are appearing, even while people are appearing, even while activities are going on, try to keep a mind on that. Notice, for the women who are walking back, many activities are going, they are walking on an uneven road maybe, they are talking to each other, remembering things, laughing, responding to questions, but, and keeping this steady. But that and keeping this steady, that's the first priority. So if it becomes slightly wobbly, everything else will stop. But that will go there. It's not that they'll enjoy a joke and let it come tumbling and down and crash. No. So that thing which they have made effortless, equally we can make it effortless. I am Brahman. Like the Holy Mother said, I don't remember it all the time, but whenever I want, it's there. It should be like that for us. Whenever, when do we want it? A pain comes, physical pain. Um, the, somebody behaves badly with us. A little disappointment comes. Something that creates anxiety temporarily comes for us. Use it. That's a call. That's a call to us. That's the universe helping us in Vedantic meditation. You may think it's an obstruction. No. It's a challenge which revokes a response. All right, now here it is. I'm going to feel anxious. I'm going to feel unhappy. I'm going to feel uneasy. No, I won't. I am an immortal being. I'm existence, consciousness, bliss. I was there before this little circumstance came up. I am there because I am there. The circumstance is like dancing like a devil in front of me. Without me, it wouldn't exist. And I am that reality into which this little ghost will vanish. I'll still be the same. Let's see if it's true or not. It will be true. Things may improve a little. Things may decline a little. Doesn't matter. I am that infinite ocean in which waves arise and disappear. And the ocean is unaffected. Let the waves arise. I am not increased thereby. Let the waves uh, subside. I am not diminished thereby. I the ocean. I am that infinite existence in which let birth come. I am not increased thereby. Let old age and disease and death come. I am not diminished thereby. So this, stay with it. This is called, with eyes open. Use it in the midst of life. Um, another example he gives is the balance. In a shop, you see a balance. Um, in village shops, for example, or in like little general stores. If you want something, the man will put what you have selected, they have put it on one, uh, one pan of the balance, other pan he will put weights until they are Balanced, equally balanced. He says, just like that, watch the mind, watch your reactions to the world. If the world side goes down and the other pan comes away from God <laughs> or from your real nature as Brahman, then you have to put more weight on that side so that it comes down on the side. He doesn't even want it to be imbalanced. He wants it to be down on the side of Aham Brahmasmi or on the side of my keeping my mind on God. We'll immediately realize the moment negativity, problems come in the world, our reactions, problems are there, it means the balance is towards, towards the world. The pan has come down towards the world. Immediately put weight on this side so that this goes down. The mind must come away from the world and come down on the side of God. It must co come away from the falsity and come down on the side of reality. What is reality? I am this non-dual Brahman. How do you do it? So many techniques are there. Here is one. Uh, you need to relax a little for this. Tell yourself, whatever I see, hear, smell, taste, touch, everything around me, meaningless. Drop it. 
it's nothing to me. All, including all the people, friends, relatives, meaningless, no matter how cruel that might sound. Only for a few minutes we are doing it, so don't, don't worry. Uh, even enemies, we don't want to let go of enemies. Drop it, meaningless. Then go inside. Thoughts, feelings, emotions, ideas, memories, meaningless. Drop. In that calmness, that space of quiet, as thoughts arise, and believe me, they will. Thoughts will arise, perceptions will arise, feelings will arise. Become aware that they are arising in me, the witness consciousness. Don't ask me, what's the witness consciousness? You have to go back to Shavana then. Drigdrishya Viveka, first class. So, they are arising, they are obviously arising in me, the witness. Each thought, don't be interested in the thought. Be interested in the witness to whom the thoughts are arising. Thoughts are many. Thoughts are changing. Thoughts are infinitesimal. They are passing in seconds. That witness is the one. It is the unchanging. It is not passing. Things pass in its light. Use everything that comes and goes. Those flitting feelings, em emotions, ideas, desires, memories. Use them all to become aware of yourself as awareness. Stay with it. I am the awareness, I am not the thoughts. I am the awareness, I am not the body or its aches and pains. As the body becomes like an appearance in your awareness, easily the world also will become an appearance in your awareness. In you, the awareness, not your awareness, but you are the awareness. Stay with it for some time. Here, you are not supposed to try to hold on to one thought. Let thoughts come. Be relaxed about it. And use every thought, every perception, every memory, every desire as an occasion to become aware of yourself as awareness. You see what I mean? Try it. You will see this is one method. Just one method. There are many such methods. Six methods are given in Drig Drishya Viveka. Fifteen methods are given in um, Aparokshanubhuti. And across the Vedantic texts, Various kinds of methods are, uh, are are prescribed. You need not worry too much about the method. Which brings us to the final matter in today's discussion. Vidya Arini discusses this. Sometimes people ask. This is a question people ask. So am I supposed to repeat Aham Brahmasmi? So we are accustomed to repeating mantras. Om Namah Shivaya. What do you do with it? Repeat it. How many times? Thousand times morning, thousand times evening. How long? Mm, till life lasts. <laughs> Go on repeating. Now, are we supposed to repeat it? And if so, how are we going to repeat it? What are the rules? And how long should we repeat it? The answer is no, no, no. You are not supposed to repeat it. You are not supp there, there are no rules prescribed for it. And there is no how long about it. Why not? What is the difference between repeating a mantra and something like Aham Brahmasmi? Aham Brahmasmi is to be known, not to be repeated. Swami Atma Priyanji, you have seen him here. So many, many decades ago, several decades ago, when he became a monk, the day he was initiated into monasticism, so Swami Gambhirananda Ji, the 11th president of our order, he gave the vows of monasticism to Swami Atma Priyanda, when he became Swami Atma Priyananda and other monks. So he told us this story. It's an anecdote about it. Um, he and the newly minted monks, they went to Swami Gambhirananda and said, We have a question. You have given us the Mahavakya, and that you are Brahman, Aham Brahmasmi. So, how many times should we repeat it? How many times? So, you've given us a mantra. You have to repeat the mantra, isn't it? It makes sense. And Swami Gambhiranandi, again, a man of very few words. And a very the name itself is Gambhiram in serious. Ananda Bliss, one whose bliss is in seriousness. <laughs> so he's a man of very few words, a very strict person. He's sitting with his eyes closed. Yeah, Atma Priyanji gives very vivid descriptions. He's sitting with his eyes closed. Uh, how many times should we repeat? Aham Brahmasmi, he said. It is for realization, not for repetition. Any other question? No? You may go. No, don't go away. <laughs> What does he mean? It is for not for repetition, for realization. 
So this goes back to the Vedic context, the Karma Kanda context. There are certain rituals and um, you know texts and meditations which are meant for repetition. The idea was if you repeat this a certain amount of punya, there is a technical term for it, adrishta, punya. It will be generated, and on the merit of that, you will attain to heaven after death. So this is called adrishta phalam. Adrishta phalam means. The result of this practice is not something that you will get in this lifetime. You are storing it up for post-mortem experience. So you will experience it, but only after death. And then how, how much are we supposed to do, do how many repetitions? Throughout the lifetime. You keep on doing it and the result of it will be, you will get it after death. Attainment of heaven or some such thing. The Vedic commandment is Swarga Kama Yajeta, Swarga Kama Agni Hotram Juhuyat. Perform the Agni Hotra Yajna, uh, the, the sacrifice called Agni Hotra, fire sacrifice, those who desire heaven. How long? Throughout your life. And how do you have to do it? Precise rules are there. As against this, you have to do it throughout your life, precise rules are there, and the result is after death. You don't see the result in this life. Because it's not a result to be attained in this life, you have to follow a set of rules and you have to keep on doing it. There's no question of till, when and how many times. But contrast this with something like drishta phalam, which gives you results right now. You are hungry. What do you do? Eat. Now, Do you ask, um, how much should I eat? How should I eat? Not really. I am hungry. So how much should I eat? Till I am not hungry anymore. How should I eat? Uh, whichever way you like. Because the point is uh, to overcome hunger. And overcoming hunger is something you will experience right now. In this life itself. Till you experience it, you eat. And whichever way you like, you should eat that way. Till the result is obtained. Because the result will be obtained now. In this life. Now this Brahma Jnana, this Jivan Mukti. Freedom from suffering and uh, uh, attainment of one's real uh, nature. A realization of one's real nature. Is it drishta phalam or adrishta phalam? Is it something unseen and waited for after death? Or is it something to be experienced now, here? Now, here. Just like eating and um, satisfying your hunger. It is like that. Since it is like that, how long should I study Vedanta? Till you see the result. How long should I do Vedantic Nididhyasana? Till you feel you have uh, all your problems have sol are solved. You are effortlessly established as Aham Brahmasmi. You have, it's your problem. You have solved it to your satisfaction. Fine. So there is no commandment. It's not something meant to be repeated again and again. It's a knowledge which you have already got. The clarity. You have to stay with it till it is stabilized to your satisfaction. You see the difference between Vedic rituals or any kind of puja and this Vedantic non-dual awakening. You stay with it till you feel that it is natural to me. I pray to Sri Ramakrishna, the Holy Mother, Swami Vivekananda. May they bless us by their blessings. Um, may this realization blossom in our hearts in this very life itself and may our lives be blessed. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu Please be safe everybody here and those in the worldwide audience. Uh, take care.